Hello everyone, Helen here. Thanks for joining me today. I'm sitting on my camper van because I'm going to give you the third and final part of the camper van trip that I went on recently with Phil, that's my husband, and I uh, hope you're going to enjoy seeing what we did in the last part of our holiday. And um, Thank you for everybody who, who's commented so far and said how much you've enjoyed following along. And I don't know, it just added to the enjoyment of the holiday while I was away and I was videoing things and thinking how lovely it was. I could share it with lots of you who who maybe, you know, couldn't could go to the same places that I've been to or, or who might like to go there one day but so thank you for those but thank you if you've just watched and if you've uh, clicked on like because you've liked um seeing seeing my videos so far and so although i said this is the final part but i have still got a few things to tell you that i'll not fit in this week um but uh so yeah next next podcast will still be a little bit camper van related but this is the final bits of our holiday today so without any more chattering on now, I'm going to uh, show you the map again to start off with and show you where we were at the end of last time. When I left you last time, we were on the Mull of Oa and we'd parked there for the night in the RSPB Nature Reserve car park, which is a really nice spot. We had it all to ourselves. Sometimes when you're camping, you just you have to find an alternative way to do things. And on the morning of our ninth day, I decided that I just had to wash my hair. So we just boiled up a bit of water in the kettle and I washed my hair in the washing up bowl on a picnic table that was near the van. It was a really wonderful place to have a hair wash. A much better view than being stuck inside a bathroom. And it will definitely stay in my memory for quite a long time. We also had breakfast outside that morning. And I love it that such simple things as hair washing and eating breakfast can become very special, memorable occasions. Well, it was soon time to set off and return to the lumpy, bumpy road <laughs> across the moorland and away from our amazing overnight spot. We stopped off at the shop in a box, which we'd passed on our journey the previous day. So an old telephone box that had been turned into a shop. And an honesty shop, there was nobody there taking the money, just a box to put your money in. And it turned out to be selling locally made items to raise funds for the RSPB, which is the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. And so I felt enabled to buy something to support this excellent charity. I chose a tea towel, which is a gift for the camper van, and a card. And both of these were decorated with prints, I think the lino prints of local flowers. Well, we soon got to the place where we f we'd first arrived on Isla uh, in Port Ellen. Uh, it seemed a very pleasant little place, quite small despite being one of the main towns on Isla. Uh, Port Ellen was founded in 1821 uh, by a laird called Walter Campbell, who named it after his wife Eleanor, who died at the rather young age of 36. We were actually on the hunt for toilets, <laughs> as usual, and somewhere to have tea and cake. We were very pleased to have chosen the Isla Hotel for our refreshment stop. and The tea and cakes were excellent and the staff were friendly and welcoming and the toilets were really nice too. Uh, we then had a little wander along the main street and came across a combined post office and craft shop called the Blue Letterbox. <clears throat> I never like to miss a good shopping opportunity. And I did indeed find two or three things that just had to come home with me. But I'll show you those next time. Our next stop was by a beach near Port Ellen, where we parked and we took a walk around the bay to see the iconic square lighthouse that I pointed out in last week's podcast, which we saw from the ferry as we drew closer to Isla. It's known as the Carragfada Lighthouse, and it was built in 1832 by the Laird of Isla, Walter Campbell, who also built the town of Port Ellen. He was clearly very in love with his wife because when she died, not only did he name the town after her, he also had this lighthouse built in her memory. We weren't able to go inside, but we were able to cross a slightly dodgy, narrow path to take a closer look. An inscription on the outside bears a rather poignant poem that begins... Ye who mid storms and tempests stray in danger's midnight hour, 
behold where shines this friendly ray and hail its guardian tower. Tis but faint emblem of her light, my fond and faithful guide, whose sweet example, meek and bright, led through this world's eventful tide my happy course aright. And still my guiding star she lives in realms of bliss above, still to my heart blessed influence gives and prompts to deeds of love. Oh, obviously uh, Walter loved his wife very, very much. On our way to the lighthouse, we'd seen a sign pointing to somewhere called the Singing Sands. So obviously we had to go and investigate. And apparently it's said that if you rub the soles of your shoes on the sands, you'll hear a kind of singing sound. And supposedly it's something to do with the size and shape of the sand granules and the presence of silica. Well, we didn't manage to make the sands sing and I forgot to video our attempt. Um, but the gorgeous beach definitely made our hearts sing. And what a delightful spot it was. So after a little wander along the beach and back and failing to find the path that our little book of walks had mentioned, we retraced our footsteps. On the way back, I was most excited to spot some more wild goats, uh, this time on the beaches, several small groups of them, in fact. They showed a vague interest in us, but they seemed to be contentedly enjoying their seaside outing. These longhead goats were used for wig making, apparently, in the 17th and 18th centuries. But when that went out of fashion, the goats were released into the wild and they've been living there ever since. Many people hold an affection for them, um, but they can also be a bit of a nuisance and cause all sorts of damage. Back at the van, we had rather a late lunch, but it was worth waiting for because the Hebridean smoked salmon pate that I had on my bread was absolutely delicious. We were booked in at the Port Moore campsite near Port Charlotte for that night. So we, uh, I think three nights before we spent the night there. So we set off again and it was soon time to prepare for our evening meal. And as well as making a chili con carne, which turned out very nicely. Um, I decided to experiment with making a bread and butter pudding in the Ridge Monkey. Uh, so I made you a little video to show you how I got on. Well, the following morning, we decided to treat ourselves to breakfast in the campsite cafe, which was excellent and very nice, very nice cafe. I can highly recommend it. And we also had a little wander around the campsite because right in the centre of it were the remains of a Neolithic chambered tomb. We had a wonderful drive to two villages on the southern tip of Isla called Port Nehaven and Port Weems. And hopefully you can see them here on the map. Uh, the weather was absolutely glorious that day and we had sun and blue sky all day long. This area of Isla is called the Rins of Isla, where two villages were set up in the early 1800s to rehouse people uh, who'd been made homeless by the Highland clearances in the late 1700s. 
We had a lovely walk around these very pretty villages of whitewashed cottages. Portner Haven is wrapped around the steep sides of a little inlet with a little beach at one end. And it just seemed so idyllic on that sunny day. Though I'm sure they have plenty of grey, wet, stormy days where it probably feels much less attractive. <laughs> but on the, on the day that we were there, it just felt that time had slowed right down and there was no need to feel rushed or pressured by anything. The church in Portner Haven is rather interesting. After the Jacobite rebellions of the 18th century, many churches were left in ruins. So in 1823, Parliament set up a commission to have some new churches built in the remoter parts of the islands. Portner Haven was one of these churches. However, it is slightly different because it has two separate entrances, and uh, which um, we read were one for the people of Portner Haven and one for the people of Port Weems. But I couldn't find anything mentioned anywhere to explain why the people of the two villages wouldn't have wanted to mix. It does seem quite strange. Across the water from Port Weems is the Rins of Isla Lighthouse, built on the tiny island of Orsay by the 19th century lighthouse building Stevenson family, the same family that the writer Robert Louis Stevenson comes from. All around the coastline of Orsay there was a large number of seals who were making quite a haunting sound as we walked along. It was a couple of days after the death of Queen Elizabeth had been announced and Hopefully you can just hear them as a sad accompaniment to the flag that was flying at half-mast. We took a bit of time to stop for refreshments in Port Weems when we came across the cake cupboard, a mini cafe set up outside someone's house. We chose drinks and some delicious homemade cake, fresh pear ginger cake and some pineapple upside down cake. And we sat on a bench enjoying our beautiful surroundings. The sun continued to shine on us as we drove to Port Askeg Ferry Terminal over in the northeastern corner of Isla. We chose not to go across to the Isle of Jura on this trip, but we had fantastic views of the mountains on Jura, which are called the Paps of Jura. the ferry that would take us back over to the Kintyre Peninsula and I admired the views across to Jura while having a bite to eat and I then spent the rest of the two-hour journey charging up my laptop and sorting out lots of my photos and videos. We hadn't had any electric hookup for about five days so I was glad to be able to make use of this facility on the ferry because um, I'm not able to charge up my laptop in the van. So once off the ferry, we drove a short distance to a much smaller ferry terminal. Uh, we had lovely views across to the Isle of Arran, who were amazingly clear. And you can see that Arran is quite a mountainous island. And although I don't think we could see the highest peak Goat Fell from this angle, we hoped that there might be the whisker of a chance of catching the last ferry of the day to Arran. But that would only have happened if the Arran ferry had been a bit delayed. And you can just see the ferry heading away from us, sailing towards Arran. Still, that turned out to be quite fortuitous because it meant that in our search for an overnight spot further along the Kintyre coast, we came across a beautiful little castle at Skipness. What a gorgeous setting for a castle, especially on such a sunny day. Now, the sheep here were definitely very contented and unusually they didn't turn and run off when I came closer to them. The castle was begun, had begun to be built in the early 1200s um, and over the next 300 years it was rebuilt and redesigned several times until it was eventually converted into a tower house by the Campbell Earls of Argyll in the early 1500s. 
So we had a really lovely walk around exploring the castle. There was nobody else there. It was really good. We decided that the castle car park would make a very good overnight spot. There was no one else around, no residences nearby, no main roads. And it did prove to be a lovely, sheltered, quiet place to spend the night. We were able to get the Kelly kettle out as well to make our cups of tea. Next morning, we headed for the ferry to take us across to Arran. Uh, we were going on a shortish half hour crossing to the north of Arran to a place called La Cranza. It's just as well we had plenty of time to spare because for the first time that I can ever remember, we were held up for quite a while by a flock of birds running along the road. I think they were probably red-legged partridges. It was hard to tell if they had red legs, but the stripes on their head matched the picture I found later of a red-legged partridge. Apparently these birds aren't popular with game hunters because they just like to run away rather than to fly, making them rather difficult to shoot. Seems quite a sensible strategy to me, <laughs> except when they decide to run along a road for a while, especially when you're trying to get a ferry. As it turned out, we had quite a while to wait for the ferry because we'd forgotten it was Sunday and the timetable was different. Uh, but eventually it came and I enjoyed a bit of crochet time on the way across. It was really nice. Um, so arriving at La Cranza, we drove down the coast road on the western side of Arran. It soon began to rain and the rain set in for the rest of the afternoon and evening. We decided that the Heritage Museum in Brodick was probably a good option for such a wet, wet afternoon. Um, there's a whole variety of information and artefacts in the museum that reflects the social history and archaeology and geology of the island. And they're all, all the things are displayed in original croft cottages and a, a blacksmith's forge or a smithy and other farm buildings. So it was a, it was a nice way to spend part of the afternoon. We drove through the rain to our campsite for the night. Uh, this was a place called Seal Shore Campsite. Now the facilities were okay. The showers were, I would say, a little cramped, but at least the warm water was constant. And it's, it's a very nice location right by the seashore, although we didn't spot any seals while we were there. We started our last full day with a treat for breakfast. We'd had some sourdough the day before and it's not so nice the next day so I used it and a couple of eggs from the fridge uh, to make some eggy bread. Uh, the, the bread didn't soak up the egg quite as well as I'd hoped and not as not as well as sort of normal bread does but overall it worked well and it tasted very good smothered in jam. We drove round the coast towards Brodick pausing for a while when I spotted this little woolen craft shop in Whiting Bay. And did I buy anything? Well, possibly there were one or two things that I couldn't resist, but you'll have to wait till next time to find out. <laughs> uh, we stopped again to eat a bit of lunch and we were parked near these wonderfully painted bus shelters. Uh, I imagine it must have been uh, some kind of community project, I guess, involving people of all ages. Uh, the paintings would definitely make a wait at the bus stop a little bit more interesting than usual. We continued on to Brodick and we had great views across to Holy Isle, which is a place that's got a long spiritual heritage dating back to the 6th century. Near Brodick we visited the Aran Cheese Shop and we were a bit late in the day to see anything other than cleaning going on in the cheese making room, but we did spend a while perusing the locally made foods and cheeses in the shop and we came away with a nice selection of goodies to try. We sat by the seafront in Brodick for quite some time, just appreciating the location and watching the world go slowly by, including watching a couple of kayakers who seemed to be off on a little adventure of their own. In fact, we had a really lovely view across to the highest uh, mountain on Arran, which is Goat Fell. After an evening meal at a local hotel, we drove up the hill out of Brodick and found a little lay-by with some lovely views across to the side of Goat Fell and to the sea beyond. That was a, another really lovely place that we had all to ourselves. So in the morning, we were up bright and early to catch one of the first ferries of the day. 
and because we checked in with plenty of time to spare we were able to make cups of tea and eat some breakfast in the van while we waited in the ferry queue. But there was only one person ahead of us when we got there so we did have a bit of a wait but we didn't want to miss it. <laughs> we boarded the ferry which was I, I think it was our ninth one of the trip and we had a very pleasant crossing that took about an hour. Um, I had mixed feelings about being homebound. I wasn't really ready to go home. I would have happily travelled around for another week or so. Uh, but I was also looking forward to being home again and getting back into my usual routines. So we disembarked at Ardrossan on the mainland and we headed for home. And that was it. That's it. That was our holiday. We had such a great time. Re I really enjoyed every single bit of it and uh, I can't wait to go away again. We haven't got any actual trips planned. We've got ideas of where we'd like to go, but of course we've got the colder months coming up, so I'm not sure what it's going to be like being in the camper van over the colder weather. We have got heating, so we should be okay. It should be nice and cosy. But um, I don't know, I'm, I'm just quite surprised at myself at how much I can't wait to go away again. Because I am quite a home person. I absolutely love being at home. And and I think, as one of you said in the comments, I think a couple of episodes ago, that this really, the van is, is like a little bit of home. It's a little secure place. And sort of, so you have that with you. And it's just that every morning you wake up and you have a different view. So it is, it's, it's really great. I can't wait to go again. I uh, have got one or two more things to tell you and to show you, but I'm going to save them until next time and update you on the crafts that I, that I did while I was away and what I've been doing since. And uh, it's also a bit of a special episode as well. So uh, I've got all sorts planned for, for the next episode. So until I see you again, um, take good care of yourself, keep nice and busy and I'll be back soon. Okay then, bye.